really comes from the fact that Python's a flexible, empowering language, like I just spoke about. The third-party libraries are very um, rich, and there's many of them. And I think one of our unique strengths is the Python Software Foundation and the community that we build locally, like here, and the commitment we have to growing the language globally and empowering folks. Specifically, where is Python used and where are we seeing growth? Well, pretty much everywhere. The web, folks who are using Django, Flask, and other things. Um, DevOps is certainly lots of applications and testing and scripting and with systems. Um, we saw a huge increase in the last five, six years in science and data science. Um, it was really cool to see some folks here presenting about embedded systems. I'm a double E by training, and um, I like the little boards and stuff, so it's great to see MicroPython being talked about, CircuitPython, Raspberry Pi, and education. We are revolutionizing how education is delivered, how people learn, and how people um, apply the things that they learn. So it really goes back to um, Guido's initial concepts of when he was designing the language. He wanted a programming language that would let people express and communicate ideas. And those ideas were for other people, not just computers. And sometimes when we see the cool, shiny new thing, we're like, oh, this is a great technology. But we should also step back and say, okay, what am I gonna use it for? And why is it important to me? Um, you know, before you learn a new language, whether it's Python or Julia or some language yet to be written, you should ask yourself, why am I learning this language? Now, it's okay if your answer is, eh, I think it's cool and I just wanna learn it, but as you, as the language gets more difficult or more frustrating, having a goal in mind of why you're learning the language actually will help you get through the challenging parts. So remember, programming, we do it for ideas and for people. Um, so last July, we kind of got a shocking surprise in the Python world. Um, Guido announced that he was done being the BDFL, so the Benevolent Dictator for Life, and he said, okay, core developers, you guys figure it out, um, how you're going to go forward. And after the initial shock, and then the thinking, is this a joke? But I know Guido well enough to know it wasn't a joke. Um, a number of us, Brett Cannon, myself, uh, Nick Coughlin and others got together and were like, what are we going to do? And you know, very quickly, Michael Kennedy interviewed Brett and I on Talk Python to me. And you know, first and foremost, I wanted Guido to personally be fulfilled. You know, was he going to come back? Was he not going to come back? Who knows? Um, but I knew that we had such great things going that we couldn't just let a change derail us completely. We needed to show the community that we had confidence in the language, we had confidence in ourselves to be able to um, continue to grow and build on the language. So we spent a number of months um, coming up with different PEPs, so Python enhancement proposals, Usually those are centered around features for a release or a language feature. This time it was like, okay, how do we govern Python? So one of the PEPs looked at other projects around this and how we govern, whether it was Jupyter or Rust, other communities. And then folks got to submit a series of PEPs. And then once we submitted, I think it was five or six PEPs, um, of different governance structures, we talked about it and then ultimately voted on it. And what came out of it was the steering council model. What we didn't want to do 
was burn out another wonderful developer like we had with Guido. It's a huge job to manage the development of Python and even steer it in any direction. And the fact that Guido was doing it himself is for close to 30 years is really quite remarkable. And people forget that there's a person behind the language. And so we ultimately had a steering council. That was the formation. Then we had a number of people run for positions on the steering council. And Guido, very coolly, decided, you know, he wanted, he felt okay being part of a steering council, so he did run. Um, and in the end, Barry Wasser, Brett Cannon, myself, and Nick Coughlin, along with Guido, have been the steering council since February. And it will go through the release of 3.8. And then once 3.8 is released, we'll have another election and um, you know, there'll be a new steering council. Now, as one of the five people on the steering council, it takes a lot of time. And what it really showed to me was how much Guido was really doing, because spread across the five of us, it's still a lot of work. So the fact that one person was doing it was um, really quite remarkable. And one of the things we wanted to do, we wanted to try and be proactive about sharing information and being as transparent as possible with the community. Because when you have a new governance, if people don't buy into the governance or feel that their voice is being heard, it's not going to succeed. So um, PEP 13 sort of lays out what the steering council can and can't do. We're not there to say, you must do this. That, that doesn't work. We try and work on consensus. We try and get folks to work together and work towards common goals. And um, all of the Python core developers, there's about somewhere between 70 and 90 of them now, um, we're all volunteers. And there are maybe one or two core developers that are partially funded by their companies to develop Python but the rest of us are all volunteers. So think about that when you file an issue or you know it takes a while to get your pull request um, reviewed. We're working on that to make it better. We're trying to automate a few things. But you know, we do this because we love it. We do it because the language has a huge impact on people. And um, so, so say thank you every once in a while to the rest of these folks because they work really hard. Please goes a long way too. Um, so Python 3.8, whenever there's a new release, it's like, oh my gosh, what's in this release? When is it coming out? How do I use it? What do I do with it? Okay, so first and foremost, you can gradually adopt a new release. You don't have to jump in the pool with all the new features right away. You just can keep doing what you're doing. I would encourage you to upgrade to 3.8 because there are security fixes and things like that in it. But what I put on this slide is where you can find the schedule and the content of what's going to be in Python 3.8, and that's PEP 569. Um, you can try it today by um, going to python.org downloads and going to the beta release of it. It's got Windows, Mac, Linux. I don't know if it has ARM, I don't think so. But And also, if you're a library writer or maintainer, you can test your project now with uh, Python 3.8, and I highly encourage you to do that. Travis has set it up so that if you add 3.8-dev in your um, config file, it will go ahead and test your code against uh, Python 3.8. And um, it's great for us when projects do do that because we find errors sooner and um, it helps get the release on time. 
So there's a few cool things in Python 3.8, and in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go too deep in any of them. Um, positional only parameters, for those folks that are writing libraries and using lots of functions, that's probably gonna be valuable to you. Um, some of the science folks have been asking it for a long time. The walrus operator or assignment operator that pretty much drove Guido to retirement um, is in it, and um, it actually looks pretty good. Um, there's some enhancements to F strings that allows you to use an equal sign um, in your uh, format of a string, and that actually is gonna be, I think, pretty useful when it comes to debugging. Um, there's some Python initialization configuration stuff. What we're working towards is faster startups of uh, Python. And um, there's been a lot of performance enhancements happening over the past few years. It will continue. Um, and actually, you know, as somebody who works with high performance computing centers, supercomputers, it's actually pretty performant. Um, you know, there are certainly places where we could be better, but it's not the wide gulf that it was four years ago. Um, and then we're also updating some of the pickling protocol because data science really needs it. And um, there's still more work to be done on that, but it's nice to see that some of it's getting in. So, oh, you want me to switch mics? Yeah, because there's some noise. There's some noise, okay. Well, it might just be me. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna say farewell to Python 2, and for those of you that attended the talk that Noah did yesterday, um, you've heard some of this already, so I will go pretty quickly through this. Um, a number of years ago, we started this Pi3 Readiness website, and I can remember a time when maybe 50, 60 of the 360 top libraries in Python supported Python 3. And I am very pleased to say this year, we are now at 360 of the top 360 libraries supporting Python 3. Um, the science community is probably pretty much universally Python 3, um, and many, many projects, Jupyter included, have long ago dropped Python 2. Um, 2020, the beginning, first day, that will be the end of core development support on Python 2. And it's, the number is not quite accurate, but it's about four months away. And uh, you know, if you want to have the countdown, you can have the countdown on your computer. What we've done, because we realize there's a lot of legacy code, particularly in large companies, that are still running on Python 2. Now, folks have had a long time to transition to Python 3. However, I also have training in management and business, and as a good business person, you need to have a compelling business case for migrating from two to three. And you know, it is possible Instagram has really um, you know, shown that you can do this in a very effective way and a fairly disruptive way, but what I believe, and this is just strictly my opinion, I think what you're going to see is some of the larger companies that do enterprise support. Ah, thank you. Um, will probably take off supporting Python 2. Um, but the core development team, come the 1st of 2020, we're done. Um, and we've also hired a project manager. Those of you might know Sumana. Um, she did a really great job in transitioning uh, PyPI to warehouse, and um, she's gonna help us with the transition so that we can at least get as much information out and a clear way to our users. So with that, Let's shift gears a second and kind of go quickly through Jupyter because a lot of you have used Jupyter. Um, Jupyter Notebook, something near and dear to my heart. Um, it lets you combine prose, text, um, video, audio, visualizations, code. And to me, it's really 
a, an amazing, it lets you tell a computational narrative or story using code and, and many other things that you have available. And it makes things much more understandable and shareable. So in 2014, I started teaching with um, Audrey Roy and Danny Greenfield an intro to Python class in Southern California. Free workshop for everybody. And I was already working on IPython notebooks. And I said, hey, let's do it with notebooks. And at least have the notebooks as a takeaway so that folks could go home and try it. And it was actually really successful. But at the time, there weren't that many people using notebooks. And now we have reached over 5 million notebooks on GitHub. Um, in the six years that I've been using it. Um, what we've seen is phenomenal growth. We've won an ACM award. We've become the de facto standard. And um, I'd like to play a short video um, that was played when we won the, um, or when we were awarded the software system award for the ACM. So it's same, sort of the same award that the World Wide Web got, that uh, you know, TCPIP, Java, many um, uh, important folks before us. So, Project Jupiter exists ah. to develop open source software. Pause. Go back. Oh, to HDMI? Yeah. Ah, now you can see that my. Do you want to see the video? Do you not want to see? Do you know how to do that? Yeah. See, now you know why I'm not good at all the things. I'm, I'm not good at this at all. Uh, uh, you can escape out of it if you want. Okay. So, um, sorry for the technical difficulties. At least, any questions so far? A lot of questions? Oh. I'll take one question while we experience technical difficulties all due to me. Yes. You know, it's, I think it, that's the question was, I'm a maintainer of an open source library that currently supports Python 2 and Python 3. What should I do? Well, it's a, a lot of that is going to depend on your users, your time, and where you want to go. Um, some of the projects that I'm involved in, we've um, kind of signaled like a year out, like, OK, we're going to drop Python 2 support when Python 2 support stops. Other projects have said, OK, I'm going to give it a year after Python 2 stops. So it's going to depend, I think, on the individual project. But um, you know, I think if you can go to 3 and migrate your base to 3, you will, as a maintainer, I find it simplified things tremendously, only having Python 3. So all right, let's see if this works now. Jupiter itself is the result of a broad collaboration. Fernando Perez. Brian Granger, Min Reagan Kelly, Paul Ivanov, Thomas Cliver, Jason Grout, Matthias Boussonnier, Damian Avila, Stephen Sylvester, Jonathan Frederick, Kyle Kelly, Jessica Henrik, Carol Willing, Sylvan Corlay, and Peter Parente all played essential roles in Jupiter's development. And what Project Jupiter tries to do is basically build tools to help you think to help you extract insight, to help you understand what you're doing with still one limited brain. So everything we do is kind of about having humans in the loop, having humans playing with the data, playing with the tools, and trying to make sense of the world. 
all of us who were there, I think, had the sense that there was something exciting about what was going on. At the same time, we spent a lot of time looking at each other saying, we're not crazy, right? And the other person would say, yeah, we're not crazy, we're, we're not crazy. Jupyter Tools empowered countless users to customize applications to their own needs. Its extensible architecture separates the execution context from the user interface. The team itself developed the IPython kernel and the Jupyter Notebook, but constructed them so that third parties could design alternate user interfaces, extensions, and kernels for over 100 programming languages. Today, more than 2 million Jupyter Notebooks for technical documentation exist on GitHub, each a distinct Jupyter application. And Jupyter Hub supports all kinds of multi-user environments, from small research groups to universities and private industry. All a fitting tribute to Project Jupyter's remarkable success. So part of the reason I showed it to you is I really wanted to thank the people that I have spent the better part of six years working with. And um, we are a small team. Um, you know, at other talks I've said, okay, how many people do you think to, you know, we're working, this was a couple of years ago, work full time on Jupiter. And people would be like, 50, 100, and I'd be like, mm, 10. Um, and so, those people really deserve um, a lot of respect and um, congratulations because they work really hard. Um, we did not get from two million notebooks in the wild in 2018 to over five million now without a whole lot of happy users and people finding value in it. So um, again, the ecosystem is rich. So now we're gonna kind of switch gears a little bit and talk about knowledge, and in particular, your knowledge. So when you start on your journey in Python or data science or even a new advanced library, often it looks like this. Okay, where do I start? What do I do? Should I use this? Should I use that? Somebody else told me to do this. What to do? Um, and it can be really overwhelming and very confusing. So I have tried to break it down into four basic steps. Preparing, exploring, prototyping, and then moving things into production. And whether you're brand new, not coded one line of Python, or you've been doing it for 30 years like you know, um, these steps still apply. So, Getting started or leveling up, I often recommend that folks try it in the browser first. You don't have the installation configuration issues, and you can actually get a lot of meaningful work done right now in the browser. Um, install Python. It is much more straightforward to install than it was six years ago. Um, install libraries that are appealing to you once you've tried them in the browser, and um, choose your tools wisely. So one of the things that I'm very proud of that our team put together is something called mybinder.org. It is a website that uh, the Mori Foundation helped fund um, to actually let us share reproducible science. But what we found out is that it's a really useful tool for people to share notebooks. Um, it is not strictly Python. You can use RStudio with it. You can use Julia. Um, and, and basically, what it is is, um, and I'm going to give a short little example. Um, Jake van der Plas, uh, those of you who have been in the Python community, is a writer, speaker, and is now at Google. He has this wonderful free and open source book called The Whirlwind Tour of Python. And let's see if this starts. So it has a GitHub repo associated with it. And if I take the URL of that repo and I go to mybinder.org and I put the repo URL or just the name in that text box, and then 
you know, master or not, you don't have to fill it out, and then click not launch. What it's doing is it's using Kubernetes and Docker to build you a sandboxed environment in the cloud. And it takes a while to start up and you know build those things because what it's doing is it's looking at the repo and then composing the Docker file and the container. And you get to this point and you now have live notebooks that you can interact with and save to your system. Um, if you don't save it to your system, it will go away because there are federal containers. We unfortunately, as a nonprofit, do not have um, the resources to give persistent storage, but um, you certainly can download it. So um, those folks that are new to Python, Check out Whirlwind for a Python, it's a great resource. Um, the Jupyter website has a lot of interesting things that you can do in the browser. So what we've done is we've taken Jupyter Lab, which is a more extensible feature-rich notebook environment for really aimed at enterprise and people who are doing um, serious data science. I still, as much as I love Jupyter Lab, I still really like the classic notebook. And part of that is because I find there's a simplicity to it that makes it um, very easy for people to get engaged and started. So on this website, you can actually click on Try Jupyter Lab, Try Jupyter with Julia, other things. And again, it'll use Binder launch you into a live and you can play around with stuff and what we're seeing is and we'll see it in a little bit third-party libraries are including badges in their readme that you can click on and say okay try pandas or whatever in your browser and i think that's really powerful for helping folks learn another way um, to explore stuff in the browser is a project that Mozilla is starting, and that is Pyodide and Iodide. But Pyodide lets you, um, it's like a notebook, but it uses WebAssembly and some different concepts. I actually contribute to it myself, and it has a little bit different feel. So for those of you that have been using notebooks for a while, I would encourage you to check it out because you can actually um, pip install libraries in in sort of a pyodide sort of way. So, um, so start with the browser, and once you're comfortable, I would encourage you to install Python. And this is the order in which I would recommend installing it first. If your operating system, and they all do, have a package manager, use the package manager. So on Mac, brew install, Windows, I'm not a Windows user, so I'm not familiar, but I think Chocolatey, and I think also um, uh, Microsoft has made it very simple recently to install Python, and all the Linux package management systems have that. Um, if that is not to your liking. You can use a distribution, and distributions are very often used in uh, data science and science, and one of the most popular ones is Anaconda. And where it differs from just installing Python is Anaconda kind of popular libraries and makes it install everything for you. Um, alternatively, you could use something called Miniconda, which just installs Python and then still gives you that Conda tool that basically Conda does what Pip does, but in a slightly different way. Um, and then last but not least, um, there are times where you were going to want to install it from python.org, and that is typically when there's a new release, like the beta release I mentioned earlier. So, so you've got Python, you've tried it in the browser, you're feeling adventurous, 
So let's try and install a library. Well, the easiest way is to just use the Anaconda that has the library you're looking for. Um, you can use PIP. PIP has come a long way, and the packaging folks have really, Donald Stuffton team has done a great job. Um, or you can use Miniconda, Conda, or Conda Forge. And some of you may or may not be aware of what Conda Forge is. Conda Forge is a community-based um, library of packages. So Anaconda is a company, and they choose what libraries suit the enterprise customers they serve. Conda Forge is very much like PIP. It's community-based, and it is all those scientific data science and beyond libraries. So this is how I would use PIP to get Jupyter started. So I would create a virtual environment. With Python 3, it's much easier than with Python 2 because you don't need any external libraries um, there. So I've got this virtual environment, which is my little sandbox. And then I just type activate it. So that source, my in, bin, activate, is just the command line command to activate the sandbox. So the sandbox gets activated, and then I just pip install Jupyter, and then I type Jupyter Notebook, and that gets started. So four commands from Python to Jupyter running. In Conda, it is very similar. First command, you're starting by creating a Conda environment. You have to, in Conda, specify which Python you want to use, and then you activate it. Again, install Jupyter, and then type Jupyter Notebook. Um, so pretty straightforward and far simpler than years gone by. So choose your tools wisely. There are different ways to get notebooks. Um, Jupyter Lab is one way. If you'd like multiple windows, if you want Python files, markdown documents, like it's really great for writing documentation. It's also really great if you're teaching for developing a teacher edition and a student edition because you can have them side by side. Um, another project you might, tool you might want to use is Interact which is much more like the classic notebook, but it's a React-based front end. And unlike Jupyter, you can actually install it like you would install a binary application. So it's basically download the installer, double click, boom, you've got it. Um, Interact tends to be, take a lot of the best parts of JavaScript and lets you compose different user interfaces, if that's your sort of thing, lets you do some really beautiful visualizations. For those of you that are in the data science world, Plotly has um, lots of graphic support for it. So Interact is another tool other than Jupyter, and um, they both run on Binder, so um, yeah. And then, for those folks that want an editor or an IDE, these are two of the best ones out there with support for notebooks. Um, VS Code is what I recommend. I used to recommend Atom to first-time developers and that are ready to, for an editor. I now recommend VS Code because of the Python highlighting testing, checking that it can do, the IntelliSense that it can give you recommendations on what to use, and the fact that it has a GitHub, Git integration built into it. Actually, oftentimes with new users, Git and GitHub can be very confusing for folks starting out, and this sort of streamlines it. And then PyCharm, um, not only being a, JetBrains being a sponsor here, but they, they've done and given a lot of support to the Python community, so um, I have no problem recommending them. All right, so that was it for step one. Kind of a lot of stuff. How are we on time? Uh, I think we have 20 minutes left, is that right?
about 15. Okay, <laughs> I'll talk faster. All right, uh, that was the longest section. Um, exploration is really important. Um, you can read about and do demos all day long, but until you get your hands on and actually explore it, you're not really learning it. Um, so when I explore something new, I try and start with something that is interesting to me. Then I try and do a tutorial. Then I look for other resources that are helpful for learning that. Then I rely and add on the community around me to help guide me to even better resources. And then I try and keep it up to date on what's new. So when I first started using IPython notebooks years ago, and actually whenever I need learn a new life, uh, language like Julia, I try and apply it to some music project because music to me is fun. It's not that intimidating and Music 21 is a music theory library of Python, so it lets you explore lots of aspects of music. But you know, you can do for guitar players, you can translate things into tab um, for those that um, use Braille. You can actually translate the music to Braille, which is pretty cool. For those that are data scientists, you can take all of box concertos and compare and contrast and, and see what structure his compositions have. So it's a really great place to get started. And one of the things that Mike Cuthbert, who's with me in this photo, he really encouraged that Music 21, you can get started in five lines of code or less and do meaningful work. And it's true. So I am a big proponent of try a tutorial. Um, one of the things in the Python world that we really strive to um, is educating the folks that are using our tools and making it easier for them to use it. So matplotlib, for example, um, it has tutorials, it has examples that you can run. Um, you can choose your topic, so you don't have to learn everything all at once. You can kind of target what is important to you. Um, again, online books like Jake Van Der Plaas's Whirlwind Tour of Python that I mentioned before, his data science uh, handbook is excellent. It goes through sort of NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, Pandas, the foundational parts of the scientific Python stack. Um, the other place to look for wonderful resources is conferences, like you are here today. That is some of the best content that you will find. It's up to date, it's looking forward, and it's usually something people have put a lot of time and effort to. Um, one of the nice things about Python is we don't hide all those conference videos behind a paywall. They're free and available on pyvideo.org and on YouTube, um, both the talks and the three-hour tutorials. So if I were learning something completely new, let's say Pandas, I would say, hey, let me see what was at PyCon US or EuroPython or APAC Python. What tutorials were taught? Was there a Pandas one? And you know, Kevin Markham is somebody we've had teach lots of tutorials. Um, very clear, this is a, an excellent one. But in three hours, you can watch this tutorial and get all the highlights. Um, for those of you that really want to go deep into AI and uh, NLP or deep learning, Fast AI has done a great job putting together free resources for the community. Um, Jeremy Howard and Rachel Thomas. Um, are the two driving forces behind it, and I would highly, highly recommend, even if you only do one lesson, you will learn something in it. Um, our community, super, super supportive. It helps you find the easiest ways to do things, or the most productive ways to do things. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, there's an organization called the Carpentries that started to teach scientists, PhD students, postdocs, 
how to use Python and the scientific Python tools. It has expanded out into data science, into libraries, and into other areas that I'm not even sure what they are anymore. But um, all of their content is free and open source. Um, you can use it, or you can ask them to run a, a, a tutorial for you. So that's a lot of stuff. And then say you want to say what's new. and. Talk Python to me is a great podcast. It's been around for a long time. For those of you that are interested in Jupiter, Tony Hurst has a tracking Jupiter newsletter, um, which comes out, I think, weekly, and it gives you what's new and different in the whole Jupiter ecosystem. And it has stuff that I have never seen before. So it's evolving around us. Open Source Directions, um, I co-host with Anthony Skopatz, and we basically take very popular scientific or data science libraries, have the maintainers come on, have them talk a little bit about their project and the roadmap of where they're going. Um, uh, GitHub Trending, you can also see what's popular on GitHub at any point in time. So that sometimes helps as a filter to sort of say, hey, this might be useful content because millions of other people have found it useful. Um, next step, prototyping. Um, start taking the knowledge that you get from exploration and try and do something meaningful for you. Um, this particular paper sort of lined out 10 simple rules for developing notebooks that would be useful for others. Um, and the slides are, are definitely online. Um, Try doing some visualizations. There are some amazing high resolution visualization libraries out there. YT is um, one that uses WebAssembly to take enormous um, scientific uh, space data sets and actually manipulate in real time 3D models. And it's fast really fast because it only maps and changes the things that are actually changing in real time. And this is all done with Python. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, one of my favorites over the last couple of years is IPy Volume, And it is a library um, we have featured on the Jupyter website. But it, it lets you do um, 3D modeling and um, visualizations. You, if you're into VR, AR, you can actually, um, there's a button you can press once it's visualized to actually use those goggles, which is kind of cool. Um, some other things that um, you can see it being used for, like um, analyzing, uh, I think that's like the inside of your body. And the other example is actually taking a skull and then modeling what um, the features might have been. Um, so very, very cool stuff. Um, another one of my favorites is uh, PyDynamics was a tutorial that um, basically was a series of notebooks that took you through symbolic algebra, um, physics in terms of motion, um, equations, it added real world data to it, and it wound up at the end having an interactive simulation of a person trying to stand and balance. And you could actually change like the length of somebody's legs or where their um, center of gravity is, and um, it's very cool stuff. And if you think about learning something new, this kind of brings it to life. Um, animation. Um, there's some really great 3D visualizations that are also beyond IPy volume. This one is K3D, and this is mapping like genetic data and manipulating it in real time. And if it weren't for the latency on the web, this would be even quicker. But the resolution is amazing, and uh, folks in bioinformatics and bio are using. All right. So the last step, production. You've made something really cool, you want to deploy it, and I encourage you to do that because 
it lets you impact other people. Um, I've had the pleasure the last couple of years of working with Netflix on um, the Interact project, and it's an open source project, and there are four libraries that I had a part in developing, paper mill, scrapbook, bookstore, and commuter. Each one is a different part of the net, uh, of a data workflow pipeline. Paper mill lets you take a notebook, parameterize it, add data into it, run it, and store the results. So if you're running the same report every morning, you might like paper mill because you can automate it. Um, scrapbook lets you record maybe visualizations that you will see in notebooks and then store them using bookstore and the commuter just gives you a nice way to um, visualize it. And this is another more detailed view of paper mill, but it basically takes input notebooks. There's a little way for you in the UI to specify what the variables that could be um, automated are and then you kind of run it and then store it. Um, Jupyter Hub, we talked about um, groups of folks getting you to run notebooks without folks having to install it. So um, you can actually set up your own Jupyter Hub. We have very detailed instructions in our Zero to Jupyter Hub guide that have been widely used and um, I encourage you to check it out. Um, you can deploy your own binder. So you have examples that you want to share with folks. You want that little badge. We walk you through how to do that. This is a nice cartoon of it. Um, and you know, it looks like a lot of detail, but it's basically taking your repo, putting it into the user interface, clicking launch, and then copying the badge um, from that uh, my binder service. So it's actually not as complicated as it looks. In fact, um, there's a researcher in the UK of the Turing Institute who basically did everything on her phone while she was playing with her dog in the park, took a notebook, developed a notebook, deployed a notebook, launched it on binder, and this is where we're going. So um, get started learning explore things, prototype, use production, um, value the community. Um, Guido said it well that a programming language created by a community fosters happiness in its users around the world, and I think that's really true. Um, we've seen it yesterday and hopefully more today. Um, when I got the Frank Willison Award, um, this is one of the uh, things that are written about that award, and it's really, contributions are so much more than code. Um, to be a successful language and community, it's time, dedication. We wouldn't have this conference without folks that have devoted their time, um, speakers that have devoted their time, sponsors who have you know, uh, donated money, and all of this is as important as elegant code. So, the last final words I want to leave you with is be practical and productive. Use Python with Jupyter, your own knowledge, and the community. Python and these tools have been designed for your success. So. I encourage you to try it today. Create your dreams, because you can. And remember always, the future of Python depends on you. Thank you.